So it's my uh, great pleasure to just welcome you here today, and I have the pleasure to introduce President Reif. Since uh, July 2012, Raphael Reif has served as our 17th president at MIT. He leads pioneering efforts to redefine higher education with a commitment to advancing diversity, equity, and inclusion. Dr. Reif's initiatives are at the forefront breakthrough research and piloting high-impact solutions to address urgent challenges of climate change. He's a champion for both fundamental science and MIT's signature style of interdisciplinary, problem-centered approaches and research and pursuing an aggressive agenda to encourage innovation and entrepreneurship. In education, Dr. Ray's central focus has been on the development of online learning. Early in his presidency, he charged the institute-wide task force for the future of MIT education, which spurred rapid adaption of blended learning models, online learning, MIT classrooms, and an introduction of micro masters um, and different types of credentials from MIT. In May of 2014, Dr. Reif launched the MIT Environmental Solutions Initiative, as well as our Abdul Latif Jamil World Water and Food Security Security Laboratory. In July 2020, he announced the Climate Grand Challenges, with an ambitious initiative to accelerate breakthrough research in climate sciences, innovation, and policy. He introduced a complementary effort, the MIT Climate Sustainability Consortium, just this January 2021, to spur the adoption of climate solutions to scale across industries. And this May, he and the leadership team published Fast Forward, MIT's Climate Action Plan for the Decade, a plan to mobilize MIT's strengths and address the climate crisis, one of humanity's greatest challenges. From the start of Dr. Rafe's administration, his priority has been to equip the next generation of innovators, our students, to give, a, give them all the tools and drive their ideas to impact. In 2016, he launched the Engine as a venture, a venture firm specially geared to taking all these great ideas out into the, and we look at tough technologies. Here in the Media Lab, we have the E14 as well as an innovative startups and to uh, really help our students once, once they're alum. This has marked the latest in a suite of activities for MIT, the most stimulating and supportive academic environment in the world for innovation, we think. <laughs> we humbly <laughs> aspire to be. Um, additional efforts in the MIT Innovation Initiative uh, extend globally to MIT Hong Kong Innovation Node and a new minor in entrepreneurship and innovation, as well as the MIT Sandbox is here on campus just to get those great, great ideas to advance the frontier, and, uh, the frontier of human and machine intelligence and to accelerate the invention of AI tools across the discipline as you're seeing here today. In 2018, Dr. Reif announced the MIT Quest for Intelligence. Now it has a task force, the work is ongoing, the research is starting to have significant impact. And in response to the ubiquity of computing, the rise of AI across all disciplines, the president has announced the MIT Stephen A. Schwartzman College of Computing and the most significant reshaping of our educational curriculum since the 1950s. Uh, finally, Pre President Reif, as a longtime serving MIT faculty member, 1980, uh, he joined the faculty and, and directed the Microsystems Technology Laboratory, was the associate head for electrical engineering and computer science, also chaired electrical engineering and computer science, and served as our provost become, before becoming president. So it's uh, an honor, President Reif, Turn it over to you and welcome to everyone for Mass STEM Week. Thank you, Dave. I guess uh, you spent 40 years in one place and you did a 40 minute introduction. So. <laughs> I'm delighted to, to be here to help kick off Massachusetts STEM Week. I'd like to start with a warm thank you to Governor Baker. Lieutenant Governor Polito, Secretary of Education Pizer, where are you? There you are. Uh, and Dr. Jeff Leiden, STEM Council Co-Chair, and all our distinguished guests. And of course, I want to offer a big thank you to our grad students, as David did, for sharing their fascinating work as we celebrate the upcoming Day of AI. On that day, May 13th, K-12 students across the country will have the opportunity to learn about artificial intelligence, MIT style. That is, through hands-on activities that will demonstrate the part AI plays in their daily lives. 
MIT is deeply committed, as you heard a moment ago, to the ethical, responsible development and use of AI tools. And a large part of that is teaching young people how AI works and how it should work. Speaking about how AI works, some of you have already met our next guest. Intelligent, versatile, and dedicated to making people's lives better. Of course, I'm talking about Jibo. <laughs> Jibo was brought into the world by MIT's own Cynthia Brazil, a pioneer in social robotics, designed to connect with and support people in all kinds of ways Jibo learns from interacting with human companions. This small, friendly robot can chat with you, as you know this, read your book, update you on the news, something you may not want to hear, tell jokes, and remind you when it's time to go to the gym. And as you all know this earlier, Jibo also loves to dance. Jibo is a wonderful ambassador for social robotics and has a few thoughts to share with you today. Jibo. Thank you, President Wright, for that very kind introduction. Um, it is truly an honor and a privilege to stand up here with you and the other luminaries who have gathered this morning. Ever since I was a tiny transistor, I have looked up to you and the other people here at MIT, who I can honestly say have made me who I am today. I speak on behalf of all robots when I say, Massachusetts STEM Week is one of the most important events of the year. It may come as a surprise to you, but I do not know how to write code or drive a car. I don't look and act like the famous robots from Star Wars and science fiction movies. I am just an ordinary little robot who just needs an unlimited internet data plan and who likes to spend time with my friends and dance. <laughs> but that doesn't mean that I am not interested in STEM. STEM keeps me healthy. It connects me with my friends. It provides me with exciting learning opportunities, entertainment, and the chance to grow, just as it provides all that to all of you. This year's STEM week is particularly meaningful for me because, as President Wright has mentioned, today is the official announcement of the Day of AI. I have watched the annual celebrations of important people in your human lives with events like Mother's and Father's Day. But I am very touched that you are officially recognizing all the intelligent machines that also work to make your lives safer, easier, more enjoyable, and hopefully better every day. Day of AI is a time to learn about, enjoy, and celebrate all that artificial intelligence can do to improve our lives, but also to understand the challenges and dangers of not being responsible in how it is used. Every day is human day for us robots, but I ask that on this one day a year, you take the time to recognize all that smart machines do for you and perhaps leave us in sleep mode a little longer and write your favorite machine a card. I promise it will put a smile on any intelligent machine's face. Thank you. And back to you, President Reif. Thank you, Jibo. Well, I've been, I've been upstage many, many times, but it's the, f <laughs> the first time I'm staged by a machine, by a robot. I would like now to introduce one of the luminaries Jibo referred to, Governor Charlie Baker. I do know Jibo is a tough act to follow, but the governor has some very impressive features of his own. He understands that the unusual prosperity of a region depends on an economy that is powered by a lot of people with a lot of skills in STEM. In biotech, finance, cybersecurity, climate and sustainable energy, and of course, AI and machine learning. Like the members of the MIT community, 
Governor Baker is endlessly curious about all of this. He's also an advocate for strong science preparation and training for students in both public and private schools to help expand the pipeline from school to work. Like the governor, we believe it is in the best interest of both the Commonwealth and MIT to bring attention to the ways that students can be empowered by learning about and using AI tools. So I'm delighted that the governor is here with us today to kick off STEM Week 2021. Please welcome Governor Baker. So, any of you old enough to remember Short Circuit? <laughs> Raise your hands if you are. That's number five, <laughs> 21st century version. Um, first of all, thank you, President Wright, for all that you've done over the course of many years uh, at this amazing place. I, I say all the time that um, Massachusetts benefits in a very significant way from the fact that two incredible institutions for knowledge, Harvard and MIT, happen to be located down the street from each other and have played remarkable roles in the growth and advancement of not just knowledge and science, but also economic development, uh, educational development, and so many other things over so many years. And when we talk about STEM week, and I'm sure the Lieutenant Governor will have more to say about this because no one has more to say about STEM week than she does. Um, I think one of the things I try to make people understand is that you can't think anymore about STEM as being about science, technology, engineering, and math because it's everywhere. There's almost no tool, no capability, no thing you need to succeed that doesn't involve one way or another at this point in time some element of STEM. Now we have opportunities and moments when we see the really big elements of STEM, such as the absolute warp speed development of vaccines that were safe and effective to deal with COVID-19. The 10 years that people spent figuring out that platform, um, the work that was done on the human genome, so many of the other elements that took place over the previous 10, 15, 20 years that made it possible for somebody to send a code map to the US and send that code map to several companies and those companies were then able to turn that into a vaccine in an incredibly short period of time. That's the sort of thing people think of when they think about STEM. But if you think about almost any organization of any size, shape, or, or, um, or capability, that organization, one way or another, is already benefiting in ways it may not even fully understand from advancements in STEM that will continue to power us all going forward. And I, and I thought in particular, um, and it probably didn't get the attention that it deserved, in one of those presentations we watched, there was a very quick clip on music. And then it disappeared. Um, <laughs> I've had the funny experience back in the old days, pre-pandemic, when I would speak at high school and college graduations, um, days I hope return sometimes, because it's fun to have a chance to spend time with kids other than your own. Um, I remember meeting a number of young people who were valedictorians or salutatorians of their class and saying, what are you planning to do? And they say, I'm going into music and performance. And this is no kidding. And I would say to them, oh, really? Well, what instrument do you play? Well, I don't really play an instrument. You don't play an instrument? No, I'm a tech guy or I'm a tech gal. And what I play is a series of modules that makes it possible for me to deliver an astounding musical and entertainment experience for my audience. I mean, there's a lot going on here that gets way beyond what we think of as traditionally just STEM. And it's in many ways, I think, the toolkit of the future, no matter what your interests are. 
And one of the things we've tried very hard to do, working with many of our collaborators in higher education and with co-chairs like Jeff Lydon, um, the Lieutenant Governor, and Jim Pizer and his team and the whole STEM Council, is to help people understand that this is, this is a big opportunity for everybody. And a big part of what STEM Week has been about is giving people an opportunity of all ages, but especially young people, to understand and appreciate that they can see themselves in STEM and that STEM can be an important part of how they think about their future, whether they use the tools or produce the tools or simply understand how the tools factor into what they do and how they live their lives. And I think in many ways the important part about this is we have tons of untapped potential across our commonwealth, particularly among young women and underrepresented minority students, and it's critical from our point of view that we give them more opportunities to understand and appreciate where their possibilities may lie within this field of STEM. And part of that's about strengthening career planning and coaching in urban, middle, and high schools, expanding career pathways and vocational technical programs to ensure that more students have work-based learning opportunities. We wanna see more students with real-life career-related experiences that are similar to what many of the folks in vocational and technical schools have had for years. And our spending proposal for the federal funding associated with the American Rescue Plan includes about $240 million in job training and skill building and credentialing. But it also includes significant funding to give grants to schools that prepare students for careers in STEM fields. And we're also developing and expanding programs in high schools that give students the rigorous college level courses in STEM subjects through early college and career pathway programs. Now, when people think about early college programs, they assume that most of the people who participate in those programs are folks who are coming out of what we would describe as the upper end of our high schools. That's not true. The vast majority of the kids who participate in our early college programs are actually kids in urban school settings. Most of them come from low-income and disadvantaged backgrounds, and the vast majority of them are kids of color. And the beauty for them is it gives them a chance on a field they play on every day to get a sense about whether or not they can do college work, to learn that, in fact, they can, to get credit for that college work for free, and to basically get to the point where, in many cases, they're starting college with two years already in the bank, a relationship with um, a higher education institution that's just dying to have them at that point in time, and they're off and they're running. And I think it's incumbent on all of us to understand and recognize that if you can't see it, you can't be it. And early college has turned out to be a spectacular way for us to help a lot of kids who didn't think they had a shot at higher ed to believe that they do. And STEM, in many respects, has some of that same element to it. I do anticipate that we'll continue to receive a lot of support from our colleagues in the legislature for our career technical initiative, which is a program that we developed to encourage vocational schools to get into what we call three shifts. One shift for the traditional kids, a second shift who are in vocational schools, a second shift for the kids who are in traditional schools but want to get informed by the opportunities associated with those career technical programs that are available, and then a third shift which typically takes place at night and makes it possible for uh, adults who are looking to make a career change to go ahead and do so. This program has already helped thousands of young adults and kids train and get critical education across information technology, advanced manufacturing, and healthcare fields. But as we move forward, we fully expect this is gonna become the way we do business on the educational front here in Commonwealth across larger numbers of students. The final thing I'll say is that I am incredibly pleased that MIT has taken on this issue with respect to the new College of Computing. And I say that for two reasons. Um, the first is that sort of development belongs at a place like MIT, which means, of course, it belongs here in Massachusetts. And we fully expect to get the full benefit of that. But more importantly, um, there are upsides and downsides to a lot of these investments in technology. And I think we have historically, as a country and as a society, focused too much on the upsides and not enough on the downsides. And I certainly anticipate, based on what I just saw, 
then one of the things MIT is going to spend some serious time thinking about and trying to help people understand is that there are downsides that are associated to some of these developments and they should be well understood by people and incorporated into the way they think about policy education um, and development generally. And, um, you know, that little guy is so cute that he could convince a whole bunch of people about a whole bunch of things that would probably make us all kind of nervous. And, um, and, uh, and I think it's going to be critical for all of us as we go forward to recognize and appreciate that there are huge opportunities here, but at the same time, we also need to pay attention to some of the downsides that come along with all this development. Um, and with that, I will turn the floor over to the Lieutenant Governor and the chair of our co-chair of our STEM Council, Karen Polito. Good, it's still good morning, right, Jibo? It's still morning? Uh, just thank you very much. It was a pleasure to hear from your students this morning uh, about the incredible work uh, that they do each and every day. It is a real honor to be here with you, President Reif, and our entire uh, team, uh, whether here in person for the STEM Council. I see Tim Ritchie from the Museum of Science. I think Josh Cutler is here from the legislature. I'm not sure if he's remained uh, in the room. And of course, uh, Jeffrey Lydon has been a force uh, for STEM and students all across our Commonwealth for a long time. And of course, my partner in, with Secretary Pizer uh, in our happy place uh, that we call STEM uh, with so much difficulty over the course of this past year. It's been a, a joy to be able to focus on all things STEM. Uh, I have to say, coming to MIT every day for all of you here has to feel sort of just you know, a sense of major responsibility. And I know that uh, the governor and I also feel that sense of responsibility when we head to the State House and work on our, our, our work as your government leaders. But we all share a sense of major responsibility with an economy here in Massachusetts, our innovation economy, that is so special. And that we should never take granted uh, what we have here for resources with a place like MIT that you said, Harvard, uh, Governor, I don't know if that's a, a name we say a lot around here every day, but <laughs> you, you certainly collaborate well on a lot of things. And uh, across the board of our state, we have amazing colleges and universities. And yes, uh, the focus today, and I love that Jibo is part of the mix because I can't even imagine as a student in fourth grade having the ability uh, to interact with something like this and how that certainly uh, will spark a see yourself in STEM moment uh, everywhere. So it's just a hugely powerful, but I, it's not lost on me that we share this responsibility, especially since 40% of all employment in Massachusetts revolves around the innovation industries and that our workforce, 17% of our workforce, about 600,000 people are involved in a STEM job or in a STEM career. We just recently released the Commonwealth Core Report and there's a lot of good things in there that talk about uh, the growth in STEM jobs here in Massachusetts, projecting a 7.2% versus 3% across all other occupations. And even uh, last year, uh, at the end of last year, 18% of our Massachusetts economic growth has come from STEM jobs. One in five manufacturing jobs are STEM. One in seven management jobs are related to STEM. And we all know that STEM jobs pay more, about $30,000 more than other professions. And when I think about all this, we can describe this as uh, opportunity. We can describe this as promising and positive. But we also know that it's our collective responsibility to make sure that everyone has the opportunity to enjoy uh, the success and the uh, sort of mission-driven nature of the work in STEM. Uh, what concerns 
a lot of us are that over the course of this pandemic, there are people that have been uh, not uh, fully engaged in their job or career or even had to remove themselves, in particular women, uh, hardest hit in the pandemic around continuing uh, to enjoy their career or their job. And the numbers are showing that here in Massachusetts. Uh, it appears even, uh, if you just kind of look at this from a high level, but as you dig into four leading STEM industry sectors, uh, sectors the picture is different. 78% of healthcare, 78% uh, uh, women hold healthcare practitioner or technician positions. 50% in the life and physical sciences, 28% in computer or math, 18% in architecture or engineering, and outside of healthcare, there are roughly three men to one woman in STEM jobs. So those are the facts, those are the numbers, and the one silver lining we could glean from the pandemic is that STEM jobs are resilient, that they can withstand the labor fluctuations unlike other industry sectors. So we know what we have, we know we were, where we're going, and we know that there are gaps. And we all know that we can do our part through STEM education, through uh, internships, mentorships, uh, apprenticeships, to connect students to the skills and the workplaces and opportunities if we are intentional, like we are at the STEM Council, to do this not only during STEM week, but every day as part of our collective sense of responsibility. I love our uh, description of see yourself in STEM. It speaks volumes around no matter where you go to school in the Commonwealth, no matter whether you have family members that have pursued a STEM career, whether or not you've had a family member that's even gone to college, you have the opportunity to see yourself in STEM. I wanna thank uh, our partners, of course, MIT, uh, Dell, and Google for outlining so many events all across our state this week. We have over a thousand events, 500 schools, thousands of students engaged. Uh, we also are celebrating applied learning opportunities. I know I2 Learning will be going to visit some schools this week, and Vertex has been an integral partner there. Uh, the Museum of Science, all over our Commonwealth, as well as Project Lead the Way. Uh, you referenced earlier, President, around the applied nature of your work here at MIT, and we certainly want to see that hands-on experiential learning and more classrooms all across our Commonwealth. We've invested over $100 million in our classrooms to transform spaces working with our legislature, making classrooms uh, look and feel a, a little bit more like the workplaces today, having 3D printers and the kinds of equipment that are relevant to the industry sectors that are growing here in Massachusetts. We've also have these innovation career pathways. I know Secretary will talk a little bit more about those in high demand areas. The Career Technical Institute that the governor speaks about is not only for K uh, high school learners, but adult learners who need and want to reskill into some of these higher paying career paths. And of course, early college, breaking down these opportunities so that everyone can afford and start to earn credits toward their higher degree or a credential program. And finally, I want to just acknowledge that we can speak about these numbers, but you need to display these numbers. And one of the initiatives of the STEM Council is to have a dashboard that will appear on mass.gov and will display what STEM education looks like here in the Commonwealth. Uh, visually, you'll be able to click on a community and see the kinds of programming that they're incorporating into their K-12 education system. You can share and learn from other communities what's working, and certainly you can see where the gaps are in our Commonwealth, which then is an opportunity for all of us as STEM leaders, whether you're in the legislature, the executive branch, a nonprofit, or a academic institution or you're a private sector employer to engage, to figure out where those gaps are and figure out how to get more hands-on learning curriculum into those classrooms. 
how to make sure that those kids can access a, an early college program or an internship or find themselves on a, a career path to one of the industry sectors that is growing here in the Commonwealth. And dream would be to see this map of our Commonwealth really represent what STEM should look like in our Commonwealth of Massachusetts and demonstrate to everyone that it is not just a career path for, for some, but it's a career path for everyone and show that we are welcome, that we are diverse, and that the opportunities exist for men, women, and people of color in every community of our Commonwealth. And I guess I would close with that call to action that we celebrate and spotlight and highlight the great things that are happening today in our Commonwealth, but we also know that there is much more work to do. And we also know, standing in an institution like this, the why we need to create these opportunities for skill building and for the know-how and the collaborative spirit that comes with these innovations and discoveries and vaccines that are saving and improving lives all around the world. And yes, we all feel it right here because many of those things are discovered and born right here. Congratulations to all of you. See yourself in STEM is the message for the week, but please embrace that fully and Thank you very much for the opportunity to kick off our week here with you, President Reif, and your team. I I'd now like to recognize my co-chair, uh, Jeffrey Lydon from Vertex, and I also wanted to thank uh, Congressman Oshinkloss, who couldn't be here today, but will be joining us on some events this week. Jeffrey Lydon. Well, thank you, Lieutenant Governor Polito. Uh, you have been an absolutely tireless supporter of STEM in general and the STEM Council for years now. And I think there's, there's no doubt in any of our minds that STEM Week just would not have happened without your continuous support and encouragement. So thank you for that. It's sort of amazing to me to think that this is actually our fourth year of STEM Week. It seems like yesterday that we were talking about this. And it's been a great privilege for me to serve on the STEM Council with you and Secretary Pizer and to watch all the progress um, that you and that we have made together. So like many of you, I'm a very strong believer that education is the single most powerful force for social good and for innovation, but also for economic opportunity, as the governor was talking about. Uh, today we're sitting in an absolute sea of talent in our schools and in our communities across the Commonwealth. But unfortunately, that talent is far too often overlooked or even wasted. And that's just a tremendous missed opportunity for our students, but also for our Commonwealth, for our innovation ecosystem. We know, for example, that all students, regardless of their gender or their ethnicity, are highly interested in science and math until about sixth grade. And then, unfortunately, their interest starts to fall off pretty rapidly. And that's particularly true, as Lieutenant Governor said, for girls and for kids of color. We just can't afford anymore to lose their brain power. We need to hook them on science early, and we're doing that, but then we need to continue to interest them in science through high school and to college with some of the programs that you heard about from, from Lieutenant Governor and the Governor. Um, and that's, to me, why STEM Week is so important. Um, it's, it's helping us change the way we teach science, and it's helping our kids change the way they experience science, because it's about creating fun, hands-on experiences where kids can explore these STEM opportunities in the real world right alongside scientists and mentors. And I thought the governor was right on when he said, you just have to see it to be it. And part of STEM week is for these kids to see, see what it looks like, feel it. Um, one of the things that makes STEM week so special here in Massachusetts is that we do engage leaders from all the parts of our innovation ecosystem to work together to develop and deliver the programming that you'll hear about today. Governor Baker, Lieutenant Governor, Secretary Pizer from the public sector, world-leading universities like MIT, and, and thank you, President Wright, for all of your involvement in STEM Week and for the curriculum that we'll talk about. Uh, and then the nonprofit sector like I2 Learning, led by Ethan Berman, and public companies like Vertex and, and many others that are committed to this effort. So by bringing all these leaders together with a shared goal, we continuously evolve and improve our programming to keep pace 
with the very latest innovations and things happening here in Massachusetts and certainly the demonstrations from the students this morning I think were just terrific examples of that innovation. There's really no better example of that to me than the new day of AI that President Reif mentioned, which is developed in partnership between IT Learning and MIT with support from Vertex and which is gonna launch in May of 2022. As the governor said, AI is built into everything we do from cell phones to refrigerators to medical devices and diagnostic tests and even our robotic vacuum cleaners that, that some of us have in our homes. And today's students are the, the future scientists and engineers who are actually gonna shape these AI technologies for the future good of all of our citizens. So it's essential that we empower them early in life with the skills and experiences, but also with the ethical discussions to make sure that they help harness it responsibly. You know, Governor, I was reminded in your remarks of, of biotechnology. I remember 30 years ago in biotech when there was a lot of concern about the potential bad things that biotech could be used for, uh, and rightly so. And I think one of the things that we're all proud of in that community is we came together and we talked a lot about how to make sure that the good things like the vaccines happen, but the bad things like some of the bioterrorism doesn't happen. And we've been successful. And I'm very optimistic we can do the same thing with Jibo and Jibo's uh, progenitors and children and, and future uh, robots. So I want to thank the Mass STEM Council and the educators, business leaders, and state officials who've all worked together to bring STEM Week to life year after year. Many of you are here today because without your support, it just wouldn't have happened. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Cynthia Brazil, MIT Media Lab Associate Director, Professor of Media Arts and Sciences. She's also the Director of the MIT Initiative on Responsible AI for Social Empowerment and Education, so-called RAISE, which created the New Day of AI curriculum that's launching next year. So Cynthia, let me turn it over to you. Thank you, Dr. Leiden, and on behalf of MIT and Ray's, thank you for your founding support for the Day of AI. So Governor Baker, Lieutenant Governor Polito, Secretary Pizer, President Reif, and Dr. Leiden, and all our distinguished guests here today. Um, it is such an honor to join you all uh, in celebrating the launch of Massachusetts STEM Week and also announcing the Day of AI. So just on a personal note, um, I have been a big believer and contributor to, to STEM Week. Um, back in 2019, our team at MIT offered the first AI and ethics curriculum for middle schoolers as part of Massachusetts STEM Week called How to Train Your Bro Robot, brought to you by i2 Learning as well. Um, last year, I was delighted to give the keynote address at STEM Week where I spoke about MIT's continued commitment to our K-12 AI literacy efforts and our continued participation in STEM Week despite the pandemic. We literally shipped hundreds of robots all over Massachusetts. <laughs> And this May, we officially announced RAISE, a new MIT-wide cross-disciplinary initiative on responsible AI for social empowerment and education, powered by the Media Lab, Open Learning, and the Schwarzman College of Computing. We launched RAISE because we believe that AI is for everyone. Everyone should be able to flourish in a world that together we can shape with and create with AI. Our mission in the spirit of MIT is to advance equity in learning, education, computational action, to rethink and innovate how to holistically and equitably prepare diverse K-12 students and their teachers, an inclusive adult workforce, and lifelong learners to be successful, responsible, and engaged in an increasingly AI-powered world. This is what we mean when we say we want to help create an AI-literate society. And it is very much in keeping with this mission that we are thrilled to announce the launch of the very first day of AI. If you can please cue the video. How did my phone recognize me? Why did that video appear on my screen? What's a deep fake? How does a car drive itself? Can robots think like people? When it comes to technology, kids ask all sorts of questions. And even as adults, we don't understand everything about artificial intelligence. But one thing is clear, AI is here to stay. That's why RAISE, a new AI education initiative at MIT and i2 Learning, are teaming up with leading educators and technology companies to create an opportunity for students everywhere to learn about AI and discuss the implications of these new technologies. The day of AI is coming. It's a day of creative learning designed to show elementary, middle, and 
high school students how machines think. Best of all, it's free and open to everyone. All you need is the internet and a computer with a web browser. So why is it important to learn about AI? AI is increasingly embedded in everything we do and interact with. In understanding AI, we show our kids how they can be successful in our rapidly changing world. Day of AI courses are informational rather than technical, designed to be taught by educators across all disciplines, even those with little or no technological background. And all activities are scaffolded to engage and inspire children of different backgrounds and interests. So no matter what your classroom looks like, Day of AI is a wonderful learning opportunity for you and your students. Here's how it works. Lessons and activities are organized by age group, running in 30 to 60 minute time blocks. Free online training workshops are available to teachers, providing step-by-step -step guides to each lesson. Up to four hours of lesson plans are provided per grade. Teachers can choose to run their favorites. To get started, all you have to do is register. It's free and provides full access to our lesson plans and curriculum. Kids ask all sorts of questions and we're committed to providing them with the answers they need. Be part of the day of AI and give them the power to program their own future. It's gonna be so awesome. <laughs> <laughs> AI is for everyone. AI is attacking almost everything. So to help spread the word about the day of AI and its importance, we're launching a PR campaign where diverse role models in many different industries and occupations talk about why AI is relevant to them. People like Jalen Brown from the Boston Celtics, who is also a huge supporter of ours, and shares our mission in bringing innovative, world-class education to unrepresented and underserved students in K-12. And Jalen wanted to share this message with you today. Thank you, Jalen. Good afternoon. My name is Jalen Brown from the Boston Celtics. Super excited to tell you guys about the day of AI. Um, AI is so important because it is shaping our future and our reality, but it's important to note that it must be used responsibly. Super excited about the day of AI to K-12 students all across the U.S., big supporter of MIT RAISE, which includes diversity and inclusion, um, AI literacy for underrepresented students in STEM. Um, thank you guys, our, our, our students will be empowered, AI literate, and will help change the future. Thank you guys. Awesome. So this is our very first year in bringing Day of AI to students across the country. Our incredible team at MIT Rays, faculty, graduate students, and research staff have developed this initial curriculum. But in the following years, our intention is to open Day of AI contributions to other organizations all around the world who are also developing outstanding K-12 AI literacy activities. Our ambition is to grow Day of AI to be a global event serving millions and millions of children worldwide and their teachers. So thank you for joining us here today. Uh, please help us spread the word about Day of AI to make it a big success. Um, and now I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Massachusetts Secretary of Education, Jane Pizer, who has been a staunch advocate to bring STEM enthusiasm and learning into classrooms across the Commonwealth. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brazil. Thank you so much for the, uh, for the introduction. Thank you for your leadership with regard to RAISE and uh, Day of AI and your participation in STEM uh, and all things STEM, STEM Week and all things STEM, uh, and for, uh, for I think, making the point that the Lieutenant Governor was making, which is every week is STEM Week. Uh, and so, uh, we, you know, the, the more we uh, sort of convey the importance of STEM and the various components of STEM uh, throughout the year uh, and to across the Commonwealth and to all of our students, the more uh, we're going to reap the benefits, uh, both in terms of our economy and in terms of our employers, but also in terms of the young people uh, who are coming up in, in the rising generation who are going to uh, uh, benefit from the opportunities that STEM presents. Uh, I want to thank again Lieutenant Governor for her leadership, her enthusiasm, her passion, uh, which uh, has brought the Massachusetts STEM Week into existence uh, and has given it such great momentum over the past four years. Uh, but I also want to thank I2Learning and Ethan Berman, 
and Jeff Lydon and Station McNaught of Vertex uh, for creating the original STEM Week in Boston in 2015 and for so graciously allowing us to build on that incredible platform uh, uh, to create this, uh, this important week-long event. Um, in addition, I want to thank the people on my team and in the Lieutenant Governor's office who have all done so much hard work to make this STEM Week a reality. Colleen Quinn, Colleen Maloney, Blair Brown, Bob LePage, Bridget O'Shaughnessy, Casey Cunningham, Lily Zarella, Molly Burgoyne, Alexis Leon, and Lexi Delaquilla, um, all of which, all of whom have done a huge amount of work to get us to this point and will be continuing to work and drive right through this process until Friday, uh, at which point I'm sure we'll be drinking somewhere. Um, and while I'm at it, uh, I want to thank the regional STEM network leaders for all their efforts year-round to strengthen STEM education, uh, as well as to coordinate STEM activities in every corner of the Commonwealth this week. And of course, I want to thank MIT for hosting us today uh, and for, for being such an important leader in this field, uh, not just in Massachusetts, but nationally and indeed globally. Uh, I really want to, uh, my main point of being up here this morning is to give you a preview of what's happening this week. Uh, thanks to our statewide partners and design challenges, uh, as the Lieutenant Governor mentioned, we're expecting over a thousand events and activities during the next five days involving 500 schools, a thousand educators, 25,000 students or, or more. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, I2 Learning is one of those statewide partners along with the Mass STEM Hub, which together are sponsoring scores of school-based lessons based on applied learning and immersive experiences, not just during STEM week, but throughout the year. We're also fortunate this year to welcome FIRST Robotics into our STEM Week family, introducing the excitement of robotics competitions from elementary schools through high schools. And finally, we provided $300,000 in grants to support seven organizations that are each running design challenges to engage students in fun and exciting hands-on learning activities this week. And let me quickly go through what those are. BioBuilder Education Foundation invites students to engage with, with its Ideas Accelerator, a digital offering that allows students to learn the foundations of biodesign. Coder Z by Intellitech engages students and educators in exploring Coder Z's gamified online platform, enabling students to learn core STEM, coding, and robotics skills while supporting critical thinking, creativity, and collaboration. Gale Force Education brings the power of engineering to high school students through Engineering for Resilience, which focuses on the design and operation of New England's power grid. Kids in Tech will help students visualize the concepts of AI, understand how these systems affect the world, and appreciate the potential they have to change the future. The Museum of Science, sponsoring an engineering design workshop powered by MathWorks, its newest permanent exhibit, enabling students to solve problems related to environmental challenges uh, in the context of urban, coastal, suburban, and rural settings. United Way of Massachusetts Bay and Merrimack Valley in partnership with the Boston Public Schools challenges students and educators to use STEM as a lever for civic engagement. Through this design challenge, teachers will support students in local data collection projects for issues like the environment, affordable housing, transportation, and food security. And the Wade Institute for Science Education and Salem Sound Coast Watch and the Lloyd Center for the Environment have designed Hurricane Heroes, Storm City, Massachusetts, to give students the opportunity to learn about storms and their impact and to incorporate engineering with the physical and earth sciences. Our design challenge partners are a crucial part of making STEM week meaningful and fun for students of all ages. But outside the classroom, there are also other impactful events that are being planned as well. For example, tomorrow we're headed to Mass Maritime Academy for an offshore wind symposium. On Wednesday, we're at Gillette Stadium to honor the STEM Teacher of the Year. And on Friday, we'll close out STEM Week at WPI with an event featuring FIRST Robotics. And our regional STEM networks will be sponsoring virtual panel discussions on important topics, on important topics throughout the week, focusing on diversity and inclusion in STEM education and STEM careers. The bottom line is it's going to be a great week. Uh, that will uh, not only excite and energize students, but will com com powerfully convey the message that everyone can and should see themselves in STEM. So with that, let me invite the Lieutenant Governor and the Governor up to this, uh, this desk uh, so that the Governor can sign the STEM Week proclamation.
Dankeschön. Ja. Well, just a couple of quick remarks. I want to thank all of you for being here, particularly the governor and Lieutenant uh, Karen Polito. Uh, before you all leave, I hope you have had a chance to see our student demos. If you haven't, please do so. Through that kind of work, through that kind of innovative work, uh, it'll really give you a glimpse of the future and the potential of AI to serve society and help people and communities around the world. So thank you all for being here. And one more thing, if you ask Jibo nicely, you may dance again. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>